my talk today. My name is Brian Klein. I work at SoftPlayer. Um, and today uh, we're going to take a look at uh, a couple of ways you can tie together a couple different pieces of software that work together very well um, to try and uh, mitigate, um, uh, at least alert um, to some intelligent degree about things that are going wrong in your cluster um, or any kind of distributed system. Um, so first, uh, if, you, um, if you didn't see it in Hong Kong or you uh, haven't seen the video, um, there was uh, uh, another presentation I gave there that was uh, similar, but it's, it's more of like a first half of, of what we're going to cover here. Um, and this is more of a refined, a, a more refined approach um, to, uh, to what we're going to talk about. Um, but just to recap, uh, we talked about how you might want to combine both uh, your metrics and your logging within the same system, uh, which is usually a major pain because you've got logging uh, being very unstructured. Um, it's never guaranteed what format it's going to be in or that it's e easily going to be parsable. Um, but on the other hand, you have metrics and telemetry, which are very structured, usually uh, specific data types, specific units. Uh, and so they're very easy for uh, automation uh, type purposes. Um, we also talked about uh, how to use a open source piece of software called Riemann, uh, which is more or less just a kind of a um, moving uh, window snapshot in time of all your systems that are sending metrics to it. Uh, and on the back end, it can send those into Graphite. Uh, you can also write your own modules to, to send other systems. Um, or you can just send a no system at all, and it'll automatically expire you know, events as they fall out of that time window. Um, so it's, it's really good if you have a ton of distributed you know, systems um, that, uh, that need some kind of centralized shared state that's very low latency, uh, very high capacity. Um, then there was uh, just, we touched briefly on uh, doing text classification um, of log messages with a piece of um, software that's uh, more popular in the uh, spam filtering community, kind of a older package, but works really well, um, called CRM 114. And if you understand that reference, then uh, hats off to you. Um, and there's also, uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about how you can combine all that to do alerting and automation. Um, behind Riemann once it's processed an event. So you could either, uh, you know, look for specific patterns, specific statistical patterns that occur in your metrics or your logs as you parse through them. Um, or alternatively, or in tandem with alerting, uh, do some sort of automated uh, action on the back end to try and fix some of the simpler problems that are more just, you know, uh, ankle biter type problems that keep reoccurring. So uh, the end goal is uh, how to essentially make our cluster, or at least the management piece of our cluster, a little bit smarter. Uh, the pieces that are sitting there watching it daily, 24 hours when we, you know, when we can't. Um, one of the things we want to start with is, is how uh, to kind of reactively resolve issues that might crop up. Um, again, some of these smaller issues that might come up on a, on a daily basis or a you know, semi-daily basis that you know, it takes time to get automation right and takes time to, uh, to dig in and not all of us have you know, oodles of time sitting around to, to, uh, to jump into that sometimes. Uh, then you might want to progress up to proactively looking at the metrics that are coming in and the log messages uh, that might indicate degradation of uh, specific pieces of your cluster um, that might be, you know, subtly warning you, you know, uh, with a specific signature, a specific pattern of um, some kind of impending failure or impending um, degradation of another kind. Um, so you'd want to start with obviously the the, the low risk stuff. Um, you don't want to go crazy and, and cause your cluster to implode. Uh, so very common things, very uh, easy things that you can reproduce um, without a whole lot of effort. 
Um, and also, you want to treat any kind of automation like this, uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, with a, a ton of testing, because if these things are going to be touching your live systems while you're not there looking at them, uh, you, need, you want to make absolutely sure that uh, what you've reproduced is an exact copy of what's, what's going on and that it is uh, within a very high degree of confidence always fixable a specific way. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, uh, in Hong Kong, I, I had a slide that, that kind of illustrated a sample architecture for all these different moving pieces. And it, it took up the whole slide. It was uh, kind of ridiculous. But um, you know, there's, there's, aside from all those other moving pieces, uh, um, there's a specific package we'll get into today that uh, allows um, a lot of this to take place inside, you know, inside of itself, and it's very self-contained, but it also has pluggability on inputs and outputs um, and an uh, incredible amount of filtering capabilities. And so obviously, uh, we're gonna be talking about Logstash a little bit. Um, the first step in all this is to centralize your logging, um, which we covered um, in Hong Kong as well, um, basically to, to have our syslogs and everything it's got um, at least you know, your application level logs uh, into a central R syslog server or something like Logstash that has a syslog uh, input um, plugin. Um, so there's uh, the actual nomenclature in the input. Um, then from that point on, you've got uh, a huge amount of filters. Um, I, mean, I think there's like two pages worth if you go on their website and look at them. Um, uh, just a couple of examples, you've got grokking uh, where you can just try to parse and make sense of some unstructured text. Um, and then uh, either tag or you know, parse it or remove certain fields, whatever you want to do. Um, you can drop an entire event. Um, you can also mutate an event. Uh, so you can, um, like I said, take a log message or a metric that's come into your uh, Logstash system or your Logstash cluster. Um, <clears throat> add a tag to it, remove fields from it that might have come in uh, via the input, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can also clone the, clone the event if you maybe want to uh, keep the original in Logstash's backend, but also um, uh, maybe take another, take a snapshot of that, modify it, and then make a more meaningful metric out of it and keep both. Um, the only thing you want to be careful of is not to produce an NS loop because you'll end up with something that looks like that. Uh, so uh, the kind of the next step um, to tie together some of the classification you might want to do with logging in, uh, through Logstash. Um, you know, as I said, there's a ton of plugins for um, filtering, uh, and you can write your own very easily uh, with Ruby. Um, you can choose to do you know, pretty much whatever you want, but uh, um, you could write a custom one to invoke the CRM executable um, uh, on your system. To, you basically feed in um, a preset uh, definition of how it's supposed to classify, like the, you know, the different algorithms you want, might want to use. Um, in Hong Kong, we covered just very brief, briefly um, just uh, kind of a Bayesian um, uh, filter that, that you would have to train initially and get it, uh, you know, smart to a certain degree um, of confidence, but um, but also be able to feed in uh, enough data so that you don't get too much false positives, uh, but not too little so that you don't end up with just um, a useless classification. Um, and uh, once that executable is done running, uh, which is usually very quick, uh, you can easily modify the events in Logstash by adding a tag to it. Uh, maybe it's a classification, maybe it's CRM, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and this will go to the back end with the rest of the event. Um, and you can use filters to build just about anything else you wanted to do. Um, if you can write it in Ruby, you, you can uh, use it as a filter. Um, 
So on the back end, behind Logstash, uh, typically you have um, Elasticsearch uh, used um, as kind of the, the uh, eventual storage for all of your events. Um, and so you can define the indexes you want to be able to search by very easily, um, or I'm sorry, index the fields you want to be able to search by very easily. Um, and you can really scale out that piece of it if you, if you need to, um, separately from Logstash. Um, there's also a Riemann output plugin as well um, for those of you who um, uh, are maybe intrigued by Riemann. I would encourage you to check it out at least, um, and I'll have the URL for it at the end, end here on one of the slides. Um, but again, that's the you know, moving window, uh, shared state, um, that should say state. Um, you can also query that as well. Um, it uses just a very simple protocol buffers uh, um, protocol, so it's very quick. And you can also use the exec output uh, to fire off any kind of other um, executable that you may want to use. Uh, if you want Logstash being the one responsible for executing uh, the fixes that you might have written, um, or the alerting, whatever you want to ha um, have done, um, exec uh, basically just lets you call out to an executable. So as an, a, a, a use case example, um, Swift, uh, uh, you know, is a very, very, uh, very redundant system if you set it up correctly. Um, but it, you know, busier clusters are not without their problems, um, and. Simple things like dry failures um, could still take uh, a fairly good amount of time to to resolve on you know a human's part, and so whether that's a whoops whether that's a simple um, you know I/O error or it's uh, a simple um, accidental on accidental unmount, um, there's uh, still you know some time involved in investigating and fixing those. So as some examples here, we've got a disk.io error, um, one, of the more, uh, one of the more severe ones you might run across, um, but not uncommon. Um, first, you could try writing a script that does a sanity check to make, it, make sure the device is still there um, once it sees the IO error in the logs. Um, if it is, uh, try to unmount it. If you get an error, you know, you probably got an issue you need to run uh, a check on, um, but you also most certainly want to, uh, if if it looks like this drive is going to fail in some way or is on its way, then start gradually decreasing that that device's weight until you get it almost entirely out of the uh, the ring or entirely out altogether, um, until you can have a better look at it. Um, Next, uh, if you've got a new disk that gets hot swapped into a system that has a lot of capacity, um, if the drive is empty, maybe after a certain amount of time, just in case you're using that disk for something else and you want to explicitly do something else with it um, after a certain time window to give you that, that, uh, that opportunity, maybe it can automatically create the file system itself, um, add the device to the ring and gradually increase the device, device's weight in the ring so that you, know, you don't completely overload the, uh, the cluster or the, um, the, the node uh, as it gets replication traffic. Uh, and simple things like running low on memory or, or your CPU th is thrashing like crazy. Um, if if it's not a cluster-wide problem, it's probably something that you would want to check out um, if it's not something that you see often. Uh, so, of course, you can get notified via email, text, SMS, or if you're still living in the 90s, you can uh, have a beeper message sent. Um, but along the way, uh, you definitely want to make sure that uh, for the sake of having this all on a consistent timeline, that you still add or still generate an event for these alerts each time so you can correlate Okay, here's when an alert was sent out. Here's when a specific uh, proactive or, reaction, or reactive action uh, took place. And so if you see further degradations from that, maybe there's a way uh, you can backtrack that. 
um, uh, very simply. So for instance, in the case of um, uh, adjusting the weight of a device uh, gradually over time until it's f reached its full weight and filled up, if something goes wrong very early in the process, that's a very easy thing to stop. And it's also a very easy thing to detect. Um, so, uh, so you definitely want to have an event that, that, that when you go back and visualize what's happening, uh, you have these markers that will show you um, when exactly things took place. Um, so the next part uh, is the part that everybody loves, is uh, how you visualize it. Uh, with Logstash, um, there's usually one specific package that everybody uh, gravitates towards, and that's Kibana. Um, it works very well, uh, both with Logstash and a few others. Um, and these, these pictures I just kind of uh, copied from the website, um, those are actual Kibana um, graphs that uh, you could you know, query a date range, just watch it in real time, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, so it can provide real-time visualization. Uh, you can build um, specific charts uh, and views based on um, search queries for your metrics, for your logs, whatever you want to look for. Um, and then define the graph type um, and so on and so forth. So you can get pretty advanced with it. Um, the, the search queries are very easy to use. Uh, if you've used a search engine at all in the last 20 years, you're going to be okay. Um, and just in case you hate Logstash, it works with Fluent and Flume as well, which I believe uh, Fluent is, uh, I can't remember if that's the Apache one or not, um, uh, but uh, you've got some alternatives there. So, uh, where do you get all of this? Um, here are the URLs here. Um, as you can see, Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana are all Elasticsearch um, products. There's, a, I believe, a paid version as well of uh, kind of a different dashboard that is uh, supposed to be more advanced than Kibana um, if you want to go that route. But um, Kibana will certainly take you very far in what you need to do. Uh, CRM 1.14, you can just install as a simple Ubuntu or a Debian package. Um, and it's very lightweight. It's just a very simple, well, it's not that simple. It's a, it's a C program, so it's uh, going to be very efficient. Uh, and there's plenty of wrappers around it, too. Um, I forgot to put it on the slide, but it, uh, there was a uh, kind of a uh, fairly popular wrapper around it a while back that uh, that people use with Python, um, and the author didn't maintain it. And I talked him uh, into uh, uh, MIT licensing it instead of GPL uh, for the purposes of using it for something like this. Um, but it it provides a, a good wrapper around CRM 14. It's not it doesn't it's not very flexible in terms of uh, um, intuitively defining what you want to filter and how to filter it um, as far as the algorithms are concerned and everything. Uh, but those uh, you certainly want to write um, on your own. Uh, the, you, you basically end up defining a file or creating a file that defines from start to finish uh, you know, the instructions that CRM would need in order to classify something and the algorithms it would use. Uh, this is actually being used, um, I think it uh, started fairly recently, being used in the infrastructure project to classify uh, log messages um, during uh, the automated tests that get run for every patch. Um, from what I could tell, it was just classifying success or failure. So it was a very simple test um, that uh, didn't need probably a whole lot of training to get very accurate with. Um, but the, I believe they're using it now. Uh, and uh, I believe as well they're using, I'm not totally sure on this, Elasticsearch possibly for storing um, the, uh, um, I guess the signatures or, or the, the log messages that they want to look for with signatures for Elastic ReCheck. Uh, could be totally wrong on that, but uh, kind of got lost looking around after a while. 
Uh, and then, of course, Riemann at Riemann.io. Um, there's uh, a good video there as an intro if you want to just sit and watch and listen uh, about how it works. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, there are, uh, you know, I started to put together a, a, a demo that illustrates the entire thing start to finish and then realized it was going to take well over 40 minutes to cover the talk and the demo. So uh, there isn't a demo, unfortunately, but I am uh, gathering um, as much together as I can configuration-wise from what I did uh, uh, manage to pull together and uh, get it out on GitHub um, by the end of the week. Uh, so um, I'll have that address here shortly. Uh, so I did want to take that time instead to do any sort of uh, uh, QA around uh, any of the setup involved in this or any of the flow or how you might uh, uh, go about you know, doing some decent classification or combining metrics. Uh, any questions at this point? Hey, I have a question. All right. So have you used uh, any standalone products like Splunk or maybe hosted services like Logly? And if so, how do they compare? Like, what's the overlap? Would you recommend using them at the same time, or is it kind of one or the other? Uh, it's probably down to personal preference. Um, if you want to keep everything internal um, and you don't have a full-on uh, Splunk um, uh, you know, license, um, or your, or the amount of stuff that you want to store is going to require a license that's really large. Um, then you might want to go the log stash route or the fluent or flume route. Um, I would say it's mostly down to a matter of personal preference, though. Um, uh, you, you certainly could use them at the same time. There's nothing to prevent you from doing that, um, especially if you're centralizing into centralizing your logs uh, into a single point um, where you can then. Uh, fan out to a number of other systems. Same thing for metrics as well. Testing. Are you running any of this stuff in production today? And can you give some examples if you are? Uh, currently not. Um, we certainly like to get there. Um, the classification um, that I was able to do with CRM was fairly promising. It just requires a lot of training of the uh, of the actual um, text and so forth uh, to get it right um, and to, to find the right signatures, especially if you're looking for behaviors. Um, so it's something that could be very time consuming to do. Um, it, it's also something that might be very cluster specific as well uh, because certain clusters may run into very specific issues um, that are due to the way they're set up in their own environment. Um, and then, there, of course, there are you know other issues like um, I think recently one of the the Swift 113 fixes uh, was a regression from 112, where if you had a disk I/O error like we uh, talked about earlier, uh, it would cause the object server to stop, um, and you'd have to go in and restart it. Um, it got fixed, but uh, you know little things like that um, are uh, kind of the goal and, and then to take to some more advanced cases like the, the, the pattern recognition and so forth. Yep. In terms of the proactive actions, uh, what have you thought so far and uh, what, what, what is in the roadmap? Like how do you plan to achieve some of these actions integrated into the OpenStack infrastructure management? Uh, I would probably say, uh, Let's see, probably a good example would be something like um, uh, staying with Swift again, or uh, maybe a Nova example. If you start to see a specific machine that has uh, you know, a number of drive failures that exceed uh, a certain statistical percentage uh, compared to other machines that are doing more or less the same kind of work, uh, which you can see very easily through Riemann or through um, you know, some Elasticsearch queries, whatever you want to do, uh, then you could probably predict pretty easily that at some point in the very near future, you're going to have to migrate uh, your hosts or your guests off of that Nova instance, if we're, if we're uh, sticking to the Nova example here. Um, 
so you could you could schedule the migrations. You could uh, uh, try to diagnose further where the issue might be. If there's uh, you know rate specific issues, or if there's um, some underlying network issue, um, then uh, it's, it's really going to be again environment specific, but. Uh, those kinds of patterns that lead up to a, an all-out failure um, are the are the ones that you you could identify. Um, things that I guess to to, to put it more simply, um, that you know, as humans, you can look at and and, and look at and see. Well, we had a dry failure here. We had uh, three over here. Uh, there's obviously a. a a very different problem going on with a specific machine. Um, and so uh, I guess those patterns that we can easily see and easily be able to identify through uh, metrics um, or through log, log signatures and so on and so forth. Uh, does that answer your question? OK, good. Anybody else? Uh just curious about, do you have any um, kind of lessons learned about how you've been managing your the signal to noise ratio in terms of um, monitoring and and whether you're alerted or not? And if you have any kind of like automated ways that you're dealing with that, or if it's just all manual tuning? Um, for metrics, uh, it's uh, I would say a relatively simpler problem to solve the signal signal to noise ratio. Um, Again, depending on what's going what's going on in your cluster. Um, excuse me. Um, with logs, uh, it may take a, a little bit more initial time. Um, you may not want to just try to train everything out of the gate as being either something of uh, of note or something that is uh, just you know routine. Uh, because that that's going to be very time consuming, and uh, you know, based on what algorithm you use for classification, it could also confuse the classifier and l actually lower the confidence rate that it has when it gives you a result. Uh, so, the uh, I guess the the best way to approach that is is probably to tackle first the 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 problems that you're re uh, seeing on a recurring basis in your environment. Focus on those, um, and then kind of fa uh, scale out from there. Um, does that help? All right. Any other questions here? Can we put this, the uh, slides just real quick? Um, as a uh, quick note, uh, we are hiring as well for our uh, object storage team. Uh, if any of this sounds remotely interesting to you, um, uh, either from a DevOps perspective or a development perspective um, uh, from the Swift side, uh, or you enjoy working with OpenStack uh, on a daily basis, um, please uh, get in touch. Um, I'll have my information on the next slide. And uh, you can also find me here or talk to me afterwards. And, uh, be happy to happy to talk, um, or if you have any other questions, uh, that uh, also. Um, so again, there's all my information. Um, I'll, uh, like I said, try to have you know some some good conf conf configuration examples up by the end of the week, uh, as well as uh, a a link as well um, with that on GitHub to um, the example I mentioned of. Uh, the infrastructure project and how they're classifying logs uh, or log messages. Um, so with that, if there are no other questions, I think we're done.